In 1999, Bart Sabrell received a reel of footage from the Apollo 11 mission. At the beginning, it was clearly labelled, This film of the Apollo 11 mission was produced as a report film by the Manned Spaceflight Centre and is not for general public distribution. In response, Jay Windley, among other things, claimed it was not intended for the public because the video contained information of no interest to the public, not because it contained top-secret classified material. He also stated, Further, there was legitimate need for secrecy. From the human end, there was the privacy of the crew to protect. Many of the debriefings were initially classified because they contained details about the crew's medical status. That's between NASA and the astronauts. But there were operational and technological details that had to be kept secret as well. The United States was in a race to the moon, and keeping its tools secret in order to win the race is a legitimate undertaking. And while the Saturn V may not have been intended as an ICBM, nothing would have prevented the Soviets from adapting it as one if they had obtained the detailed design and performance information. And yet, in the same article, Windley claims that these transmissions were broadcast live and thus seen by millions. That's a wonderful way to keep your medical status and technological secrets private. Broadcast them live for the whole world to see. How very secretive! Returning to the QST article, when Wilson and Nadal talk about tracking Apollos 10, 12, 14 and 15, they cite four different sources. The first one is a QST article from an earlier issue, To the Moon and Back, on 2300 MHz. But don't judge an article by its title. It may sound like an article about tracking Apollo to the Moon and Back, but it's not. Amateur radio signals have been sent to the moon and back on 2.3 gigahertz, the echoes having been received at a terrestrial distance of 750 miles from the point of origin. This entire article is about moon bounce, not tracking spacecraft, and it doesn't say a word about Apollo. Wilson and Nadal's second source is an early QST article written by Wilson himself. His only mention of Apollo consists of a brief sentence at the very end. Replacing the 45 megahertz converter crystal with one at 44.6 megahertz made possible reception of signals from Apollo 10 and 12 missions orbiting the moon. Again, no mention of tracking Apollo all the way to the moon and back, just when it was in lunar orbit. The last two sources are two previous articles, one from 1970 and one from 1964. Both are about moon bounce and not tracking Apollo. Later, on page 95 of the June 1972 issue of QST, Wilson also claims to have tracked the Apollo 16 command module, but again, no mention of tracking it the whole way to the moon and back. Wilson states that his first acquisition of signal was on April 19, 1752 Greenwich Mean Time, or 5.52 p.m. Loss of signal was at 1917 Greenwich Mean Time, or 7.17 p.m. According to the Lunar and Planetary Institute, Apollo 16 performed its lunar orbit insertion burn on April 19, 3.22 p.m. Eastern Standard Times. Because Eastern Standard Times is five hours behind Greenwich, this means Apollo 16 entered lunar orbit at 8.22 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. This means that Wilson first picked up Apollo 16's signal at two and a half hours before the craft supposedly entered lunar orbit. Around that time, Apollo 16 was said to be 6,322 nautical miles away from the moon, which is 11,708 kilometers. Naturally, the lunar orbit insertion burn takes place on the far side of the moon, 
meaning Houston would be out of contact with the craft during this time. According to the flight journal, Houston lost contact with Apollo 16 around 74 hours and 17 minutes into the flight, which is 8.11 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Because Wilson lost contact at 7.17 p.m., this means that he lost the signal almost an hour before Houston did. Wilson goes on to say that he picked up Apollo 16's signal a second and a third time on April 19 and a fourth and final time on April 20. Again, no word of tracking Apollo all the way to the moon and back, only when it was near the moon. Back on Rogan's forum, the third person cited is Seven Gran who in fact is not a ham operator, but a member of the Swedish Space Agency, which is now a division of ESA, one of NASA's international partners. But even if we hear Grand's story out, we find that even he cannot attest to having tracked Apollo all the way to the moon and back. In a nutshell, Graham states that he met up with his friends Dick Flagg and Wes Greeman and went down to Florida to witness the launch of Apollo 17 and track it until it was out of range. We were lucky and got through the traffic jam and out of the rocket base very quickly and got back to Titusville in time for the first transit of the spacecraft over Florida at 0208 hours local time, 0708 universal time on December 7th, we picked up the very characteristic PCM buzz on the TM frequency 258.5 megahertz from the last stage of the Saturn V booster which was still attached to the spacecraft. It is important to note that in the beginning of this mission the Apollo spacecraft is still in low earth orbit meaning controllers on the ground can only pick up the signals for about four minutes because that's how long it takes for the craft to make a complete transit over one's head. Graham goes on to state On the next transit, the spacecraft passed very close to the local horizon and telemetry and voice signals were picked up weekly between 0343 and 0346 hours local time. A few minutes later, 0354 hours local time, Apollo 17 was fired out of Earth orbit and changed from VHF transmissions to microwaves, 2287.5 megahertz. Because of these breaks in the tracking, it's possible that on the next pass, he was listening to an unmanned craft that was broadcasting pre-recorded signals. But what's worth noting is that Graham doesn't testify to tracking Apollo 17 after its translunar injection burn. Instead, as Graham puts it, they resumed tracking after a few days rest. He goes on to say that on December 10th, 1972, we picked up our first signals on S-Band. December 10 was the day Apollo 17 supposedly entered lunar orbit. Just like Wilson and Nadal, Graham only testifies to having tracked these signals from when Apollo was in lunar orbit. Granted, he also claims to have picked up signals from the lunar module some 80 minutes after touchdown, but he does not attest to having tracked Apollo 17 all the way to the moon and back. This is exactly the same story we got from Drodrell Bank. Despite claims from the propagandists that the British tracked Apollo all the way to the moon and back, Bob Pritchard now states that they only picked up signals when the craft was within 1,000 miles above the lunar surface. The last two sources cited at Joe Rogan's forum were Carnarvon Tracking Station and Honeysuckle Creek, both of which are NASA facilities and thus should not be counted as independent verification. 